Wine Work and Passion is brought to you by the Napa Valley Wine Academy, America's premier wine school and two-time winner of the WSET Global Wine Educator of the Year Award. You can find a course that's right for you at NapaValleyWineAcademy.com and use the code in our show notes for a special discount. Welcome, wine enthusiasts and job seekers. I'm your host, Karen Wetzel, and Wine Work and Passion is the podcast where we inspire you to make a career out of your passion for wine. My guest today is Laura Diermund, Head of Viticulture for Newton Vineyards and a 2022 Wine Enthusiast Future 40 recipient. In this episode, Laura shares her passion for farming grapes sustainably and organically to preserve the ecosystem in the vineyard. She'll also talk about the various roles it takes to manage and maintain a working vineyard, and she'll give advice to help you get your hands dirty in the vineyard too. And now let's meet Laura. Hi, Laura, how are you today? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Welcome to Wine Work and Passion. Appreciate you being here. Um, Can you tell our audience who you are and what you do in the wine industry? My name is Laura Diermond. I'm the head of viticulture at Newton Vineyard. Great. Thank you. So um, I wanted to tell the audience how this came, this episode came to be. So I was fortunate enough uh, in the fall to be invited to your harvest dinner at Newton and what a wonderful event it was. And you and I got to talking and you were so nice and so informative and engaging. And I said, you know, this is this is the type of job, you know, women in viticulture is not all that common. So I thought this is a great message to bring to the audience about uh, about viticulture jobs and how to get ahead. So uh, you were gracious enough to accept my offer and I appreciate it very much. Um, so tell us what was in your glass the last time you had a glass of wine? Uh, last night, actually, uh, we had a kind of after work, little glass of wine, you know, Tuesdays can be tough sometimes. Uh, (laughs) uh, So we had a a New Zealand sparkling from Cotty Bay called Polaris. Um, So we had that in the office yesterday. It was quite nice. nice. Yeah. That's wonderful. That sounds delicious. I drank my share of sparkling wine when I was down there in New Zealand a couple of times. It was a lot of fun. (laughs) They make great sparkling wine. I don't think people really think of it, but they, they do. So good. Well, I had a, a Bedrock Syrah from oh, nice. Joel Peterson's sonnet. For those of you who know the godfather of Zinfandel, Joel Peterson, his son has his own label called Bedrock. And I had a really lovely Syrah from him last night. Very good. Okay. So tell us about you. What do we need to know? Tell us, you know, maybe where you're from, where do you live now? You know, maybe a little bit about your education and life experiences. Yeah, um, I'm originally from Boston, uh, which everybody knows is a world famous wine growing area. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So I um, have always been a plant aficionado. Um, You know, I had a little garden in the backyard where we grew pumpkins. Uh, I made some salsa uh, from the tomatoes that I grew, and I just always was into science, um, big fan of Magic School Bus and Bill Nye the Science Guy. That's kind of what formed me. So I uh, went to college at University of Massachusetts, studied plant and soil science, thinking I was going to go into apples because that's the main um, kind of crop out there that wasn't potatoes. Right. Took a class on orchard science, literally ate so many apples that I could not, like I'm not even exaggerating, I could not eat an apple for a year. I was just kind of worried, like, what am I going to do? Um, I lucked out getting an internship in New York on Long Island uh, at a winery out there and just kind of fell in love with the combination of, you know, had hard agriculture, growing plants, but then the finished product is a little bit more refined than an apple because this was before cider, hard cider kind of became a big craze. Right. Yeah. So while well, I was working there in the summers, um, UMass, uh, ended up getting a grant to start a small pilot winery and vineyard. Um, so making wine out of hybrid grapes. So a blend of the French varieties. So like we had um, Chardonnay, which was a combination of Chardonnay and I think Frontenelle. So we made some interesting wines. Uh, I learned how to 
prune, table grapes. And so basically I got to work in the vineyard all year, kind of a combination of working at university's experiment station and also out in the um, New York. But I always wanted to get to California as somebody who grew up in snow and the cold, you know, seeing movies and television of beautiful California and the sunshine. <laughs> that was always kind of the back of my mind. And so I um, knew I needed something else on my resume just to try to get people in California to even be interested. So I figured I should probably get my master's. <laughs> um, so uh, I knew I needed to learn about irrigation mm -hmm. uh, because in, on the East Coast, it rains all summer. So we never had to irrigate. And so I went to uh, Washington State out in the Upland High Desert of Prosser, Washington. Uh, wow. at the experimentation there. Learned about drought stress in Merlot. Uh, worked there for about two and a half years. It was a big culture change going from, you know, beautiful New England fall to actual tumbleweeds rolling past. Yeah, uh, realize, the Columbia Valley in Washington is virtually a desert and eight inches yeah. of rain all year. It's really, we think of Washington like Seattle where it rains all the time, but no, you get east of the Cascades and it's dry as a bone. <laughs> yeah. So it was a culture shock on many levels, uh, <laughs> but it was a good experience. And so in 2012, I got an opportunity to come down to Napa. I got a job as an assistant viticulturist at a farm labor company, uh, worked there for about a year and then moved up to a role as viticulturist at a place in over in Windsor. So in Sonoma County. Um, and then eventually after a few years there, up to come back to Napa. Um, and I've been working in Napa kind of ever since. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned apples, you know, that, that was kind of where you started because a lot of times, especially with beginner students, because, you know, I teach and a lot of times, you know, they, they, they kind of can't grasp the, the different varieties that we have, the different varietals. And, and I say, well, think of it like apples. You go to the store during apple season, there's bin after bin, they all have different names, they're all a little bit different colored, they all have different yep. acidity levels and textures and all that. So think of grapes, you know, very, in some ways have some similarities to, to apples. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's funny that you came from apples. It made me think of that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Washington is, it's a great place to, to learn, I'm sure. And I've been up there a couple of times, but it is bone dry. Like it's, it, it's the only place I've ever been where as the river flows, the Columbia river flows, it is Brown all the way to the edge of the river. Like usually you yeah. think of a river edge, you know, the sides of the river being lush and green. No, it's, it's just dirt, just dry dirt. <laughs> yeah. There was, it was my birthday. So my birthday is in August. So I was out doing sampling all day measurements for my research and, you know, I was drinking gallons of water Right. And it, I think by like three o'clock, I realized like, all right, I haven't gone to the bathroom all day. <laughs> right. I am dry as a bone. Like, where is this water going? And it was just yep. so hot and so low humidity that like the moisture was just evaporating from me instantly. Right. Uh, and I was just, yeah, I just remember being like, I can't live here forever. Oh no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is like Arizona dry. My eyes get dry, my hair, my skin, everything wants to crack. <laughs> oh, funny. Okay. So, um, so now you're living in Napa? You live in Napa or Sonoma? I live in Santa Rosa, so kind of in a smack dab in the middle of Sonoma County. Um, I like living in Sonoma County, working in Napa County. It kind of has that natural separation of work-life balance. I think that's yeah, really I important. think that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's really kind good. of the best of both worlds. I have my cow friends that I pass in the morning. You know, yeah. it's kind of <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Those who haven't been out to wine country, you know, Napa and Sonoma couldn't be any more different from each other. I mean, in Napa, we've got two roads going north and south and 500 wineries that sit alongside those. So it's just like winery after winery after winery after, and that's all we do. You go to Sonoma, it's, well, first of all, it's physically three times the size of Napa, and it's all spread out. And there's, you know, beautiful vineyards, but there's cow farms and there's orchards and, you know, sheep farms and all kinds of other agriculture. And you, you have to go in search of the wineries. They're not just, you know, sitting right on the side of the road so much like they are here in Napa. Yeah, someone um, told me that Sonoma County is the same size as the state of Rhode Island. I mean, granted, oh, wow. Rhode Island is a yeah. tiny state, but just yeah. visualizing. Yeah, it's a, it's a big county for sure. And all, the other thing people don't understand is, 
Napa and Sonoma are is separated by a very large mountain. <laughs> so it's not, if you look at a, just a flat map and you see, oh, Napa and Sonoma, oh, they're close together. Yeah, not so much. You either have to go over the mountain, which I won't do anymore. It's you know, <laughs> very windy. Or you're going to have to go around either the north or the south. <laughs> so it's not as close as it seems. You know, people are like, oh, it looks like 20 minutes. No, no, it's more like an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> So anyway, okay, well, you know, we're going to talk about your role at Newton, uh, but first let's talk about Newton. Tell us about Newton Vineyards and, and what, what should we know? What's the history? What's it like there? Yeah, so Newton Vineyards was uh, founded in 1977 by Peter Newton and his wife, Suha. You know, he came from the paper industry in England, um, but he was really a, um, a botanist at heart. And so sustainability from the get-go at Newton has always been our passion. Um, and that's really what interested me when this, when the position, um, that I took almost five years ago at Newton came up, you know, it really coincided with what my passions were, which is sustainability. And so yeah, Newton, uh, where the flagship estate property is on Spring Mountain, which is in St. Helena. So it's on the mountain range that connects Sonoma County and Napa County. It's the Mayacamas range. We have vast different um, elevations. So 600 feet above sea level, all the way up to 1600. Basically our blocks point in every cardinal direction. Um, you know, we have all, we had all five Bordeaux varietals before the fire. We did burn in the 2020 glass fire. So yeah, that's I was kind of gonna say, tell us what happened. Tell us what happened. Yeah. Um, so kind of smack dab in the middle of harvest in 2020 in September, um, there was a fire that started on the other side of the valley. So on the Vaca range, so about 10 miles, I think is how, or yeah, the Napa Valley is pretty narrow, but anyway, um, on the second night of the fire, the fire jumped across, uh, the valley and quickly took out the entire property, um, because our hillsides are so steep and uh, our blocks are so small, the damage was pretty devastating to us. You know, our winery was built out of redwood, which is quite flammable. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> um, so yeah, we're we're kind of in this process of rebuilding, replanting, kind of going through everything. Um, you know, it's taken a while for us to kind of get to the point where we're. I guess in a better place, you know, we're kind of focusing on the future, uh, looking at the opportunities that we have, but it's definitely been a process, you know, going through all the stages of grief, as you would imagine, you're already right. exhausted and now you're at your mental end during harvest. So then adding a fire to it doesn't really help. Right. But yeah. it's kind of an unfortunate um, once in a lifetime opportunity that hopefully I don't have to do again, but replanting an entire estate from scratch. So the irrigation system, the vineyard, everything. Um, yeah, it's going to be a, a couple of year process, but you know, we're, we've already started, so it's going well. And, and you're still making wine and you have a temporary tasting room um, yeah. in Calistoga. Cause I've been there. And it's actually for a temporary tasting room. It's pretty, well, I, I, I think you share a tasting room, right? With Brasswood or no? Or no, yeah, it's your... so Brasswood owns the facility. It's a custom crush. So uh, Brasswood has their own wine, but they also um, allow other wineries to make wine there. But they, so we are making wine at their new. Yeah, so we're making wine at their new facility in Calistoga. And then with that um, contract, we have exclusive access to their, to their brand new tasting room at the facility. Yeah, and the tasting room is not right at the Brasswood complex. It's kind of down the, the road a ways. Yeah, right. it's off of uh, Tubbs Lane, so kind of near Chateau Montalena. And I'll tell you what, it, it for a temporary housing for you guys, you couldn't ask for a better spot. It's absolutely beautiful. In fact, after the harvest party, I posted all kinds of pictures of the great views. It's very intimate. Um, I just, because of the fire, I don't want people to think you're not functioning because no, you're no, functioning okay. very well. And, and the hospitality there is really uh, exceptional. So, you know, don't uh, don't hesitate to seek out Newton just because their winery up on the hill is not there right now. It'll be there, but go check out their wines because they're amazing. So just wanted yeah. to get them out there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, they're out of business. No, definitely not out of business. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. no, we're still going. Good. OK, good. Funny that you that you say um, that the that Mr. Newton was a botanist because so many wineries here get started 
by people who have the drive to be winemakers. And then they figure out the vineyard thing. But I think it's very interesting that it really started with the farming at Newton. And I think that's really something that sets you guys apart. That, you, like you said, you've been sustainable from the very beginning when the focus is on growing um, the wine, you know, the wine, the wine, I don't want to say it's easy because it's not easy, but if you have amazing grapes, you're going to have amazing wine, right? And, and I tell people all the time, you, the viticulture part of it, the farming side of it is so important because winemakers are not magicians. You know, you cannot deliver lousy grapes and expect to get a, a hundred points in the spectator, right? Yeah. So, um, so the, the farming side of, of winemaking is just really, it's where it all starts, really. It all starts on the vineyard. We say that all the time, don't we? <laughs> it does, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. That's a big responsibility. Yeah, and I studied sustainable agriculture um, in school, and so um, that's always been something I'm, I find really important, um, especially organics. Um, so we're certified organic. We've been at Newton certified since 20, 2020. Um, that's a three-year process, so you have to show that you're farming organically. So not using conventional products for three years um, and have all the documentation that proves that. It's a lot of paperwork. And after your three years of success, they give you the, the fresh stamp of organics. And for us and for me, like that really goes along with my philosophy of farming. I'm not going to have my team um, do something that I'm not comfortable doing myself. So right. You know, whether you know it's spraying a chemical or you know digging a really deep soil pit, you know if it's not safe, it's not worth it. At the end of the day, I want my team to go home in the same condition they came, and so that's yeah. why organics are really really important. Um, you know, not just for people, but for for the wildlife and for the environment around us. Right, exactly. And you mentioned. Earlier on, you said, you know, Newton's always been sustainable, and now we're talking about organic. Can you just real quick tell the audience what the differences are and how they can work together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, um, we farm sustainably and organically. Um, so sustainable agriculture basically takes the entire property as a large ecosystem. So you're making sure that you're not causing a lot of sediment to enter the water system. You know, um, so you're in the winters, you're making sure there's grass, and you don't have barren ground um, in the winter, um, because the sediment that can come off of your vineyard can then make it into the water and then suffocate fish. Or your um, we have fences around our vineyard because deer, um, just like they can be in your garden, um, your flower beds at home, they also can be a big problem for vineyards because they, you know, one bite during spring, during bud break, and there goes your entire shoot. Right. And so we we have fences around our vineyard blocks, but we also um, have wildlife corridors because our property is a square mile. So it's a good amount of land. And we only have a small portion of that actually planted to vine. And so we want to make sure that the larger animals can migrate around. You know, we have a bear that used to love the Malbec. <laughs> It took out my, we have some uh, bees on site, some hives. It helped itself like Winnie the Pooh style to our, our hives over the Christmas holidays a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. Exactly. The hives were just scattered down the terrace. And I was just like, ah, but you know, I'm <laughs> glad it had something to eat. So yeah, it's really just kind of farming in a way that you're having a lesser impact on future generations. So always thinking in the forefront. And organics um, kind of takes that, and then makes it a little bit more, um, I guess, future forward and softer on the environment. So with organics, you really have to think proactively instead of reactively. Um, I think that's the biggest challenge for people when they do convert from conventional to organics is just you really have to be thinking uh, for the future. So, you know, since you can't use pesticides, you have to use predator insects or oils or something. So you have to be kind of monitoring your vineyard checking. And as soon as you have, you know, six leaf hoppers per leaf in your vineyard, you got to go out there and release lace wing larvae. You know, you got to be out there quick because, you know, insects, the predators are only as good as how much you put them out. And so it's really just using natural ways to farm with the environment instead of against it. I think that is really kind of what organics is. 
Right. Yeah. I, I, that's, you, you have great ways of describing that. And I love like the, like you say, the predator insects and, and you can plant cover crop that encourages that ecosystem too, right. That will attract the good bugs that will eat the bad bugs and, and all that. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Well, thank you. Cause a lot of people, you know, I think or people think organic is the whole picture and it's a piece of, it's a, it's a big important piece of sustainability, but sustainability covers other things, different things as well. So anyway. Yeah. 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 And if it's even down to like the rattlesnakes, you know, I always try to tell the crew, like, I know that they do kill them because they, you know, it is scary, but I always try to remind them every year in our safety conversations, like just leave the block and come back later, like leave the rattlesnake. It's an important part of the integrated pest management. Like that rattlesnake is going to be taking care of the gophers, hopefully Uh, that will be, you know, hurting the vines. So maybe leave the rattlesnake. We can come back to that block tomorrow and hopefully by then it'll move moved on. (laughs) <laughs> wow. I never thought about rattlesnakes. That's, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be a viticulturalist anytime soon. <laughs> but for those of you who like nature, you're going to get your fair share of nature for sure. <laughs> oh my gosh. So why did you choose Newton Vineyard at this point? Is it Was it that whole philosophy of sustainability? How did that come to be that you came to work there? Uh, yeah, so I had been working, um, I was working at Treasury Wine Estates before, um, as their Sonoma County viticulturist. So I had all of Carnero. So the Carneros AVA overlaps both Napa and Sonoma because it's based off of the geography and climate down in Southern, um, Napa and Sonoma, all the way up to, uh, Knights Valley, um, Asti kind of Northern Sonoma. Oh, is that all? Jeez. Yeah, I had everything <laughs> from Pinot to Cabernet. Um, yeah. So there I, you know, I was uh, working at Treasury for about three years and just kind of wanted to move on, but there wasn't really anything within. And I, I knew the head of viticulture at Newton. Um, I'd worked with her previously, actually, at, when I was at Diageo. <laughs> And so she um, was creating a viticulturist and grow relations position. And so it just really sounded interesting in conjunction with um, how Newton farmed and how that kind of, you know, seemed like it was going to be a great fit. I had never done grow relations before. And so that was something that would be different and kind of a new thing for me to learn. Yeah, I think viticulture, people don't realize is there's a kind of a typical type of person that does viticulture because you're by yourself a lot. It's just you in the vineyard walking, almost doing triage like you're in the ER and you're a nurse. You're just constantly scanning, looking for bugs, looking for pests, looking for any virus. You know, it's kind of takes away the romance of a vineyard a little bit, but you're just constantly looking for issues. Whereas grower relations is you're doing contracts. It's a little more business minded. You're interacting with growers who you're buying fruit from or you're selling fruit to wineries, but you're still doing the vineyard scouting. You're still looking and making sure that the people you're buying fruit from are matching the quality that you're expecting. And then um, dealing with those personalities during harvest. Um, And so it's, it's kind of, it's similar. It's a similar track almost. But it has a different skill set. So I never had to negotiate before. So now I'm like, next time I buy a car, I'll be ready. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, do they um, negotiate on cars anymore? I don't know if they do. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> but um, yeah, so it just, it had um, a lot of the same philosophies that I liked. And then it had kind of something new to learn. Because it's always right. it's always great to keep continuing learning. Yeah, it. it's a different business model when you're working with grower relations um, as opposed to, you know, just farming your own fruit. So you're right. It, it does add uh, some dimensions. So something the audience doesn't know about you is you were named to the Wine Enthusiast Future 40 list in 2022. So Future 40, for those who don't know, they used to do a thing called 40 Under 40. Uh, and that was 40 up and coming people in wine, doesn't have to be winemakers or viticulture, it could be anybody involved in the wine industry. Uh, 40, you had to be under 40 years old and they listed 40 people. Well, thank goodness they got rid of that under 40. I mean, I could make the list now. <laughs> Not that I would, but anyway, uh, you know, in, in our world, that is quite 
really a very prestigious award. And, you know, yeah. My Enthusiast magazine is a pretty big deal. So tell us about that. How did it come about? And, and what's it like being a, a future 40? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was nominated. Um, I'm not really exactly sure by who, but I got a very like secret confidential email from Wine Enthusiasts saying that I was I had been nominated and that they would be reaching out soon and I couldn't tell anybody, not even my mother. Oh, <laughs> you know, so of course, uh, I was allowed to tell our head of marketing, um, Natali, <laughs> but yeah, so I uh, had to do a photo shoot um, for the magazine, which was weird because um, I, you know, we had we were directed to wear either all white or all black, and as a did you male. Change? Yeah, I chose all white. I was told to wear all white because, oh, okay. um, which was very stressful because, yeah. you know, I, my photo was in the vineyard. I never wear white because oh, I am yeah. <laughs> and I am accident prone. And, you know, I was going to be holding a glass of wine. And so I was just like, you know, walking around like on ed- eggshells essentially <laughs> for the photo. And yeah, they wrote up a little, um, a little blurb about me, um, kind of focusing on the redevelopment of the property. And so yeah, I was the only person from wine growing um, who was featured. So that's, that's nice. a real honor. And yeah, I've never looked so polished as I do in that photo. So. <laughs> you <laughs> recognize photo yourself? <laughs> That's um, I recognize myself with all that. <laughs> yeah, my dog was able to be in the photo. He's a little bit in oh, it. Um, oh, he wonderful. Able, but he's at least there. Oh, but yeah, it was truly an honor. And um, we kind of have like a cohort uh, Instagram feed kind of chat of all the people, all 40 of us. Um, nice. So it's kind of a little like hype machine. So if somebody's going to be at an event, they're like, come check it out, come support. And so we're all right. kind of a part of that. Oh, well, that's cool. But yeah, it's definitely been um, interesting, kind of humbling. I yeah. never thought I would be in that. So <laughs> I think that's awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. I think I think it's great. I mean, I remember back in the day when the 40 under 40 were all white guys. <laughs> that was about it. So it's really changing. It's much more diverse now when many more women, many more people of color. It's uh, it really reflects the industry, I think, a little a little better now, uh, which is yeah. great. Um, and speaking of that, so, you know, being a woman in viticulture, um, not that common, really, maybe a few more winemakers than viticulturalists. But, you know, so what what do you what has been your journey as a woman in this industry? Yeah, so I've I've been in the industry since I was 19. Um, you know, I'm under 40. So <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> <don't see> <laughs> but I'm getting close. Um, so it's been it's been a while. So I you know started as an intern and worked my way up always on the viticulture side on the vineyard sides. And so working with the crew, which are 90%, you know, back in the early 2000s, were all men. You know, I, I don't know, I just kind of always tried to stay authentic to myself. You know, there was that whole f- craze of leaning in and women have to act like men in order to be taken seriously. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm very much a bubbly person. Um, I wear pink in the vineyard, like I'm colorful. So wearing all white that day, I was like, I don't own white. I own like blue and pink and green, <laughs> you know? And so I have always just kind of tried to stay authentic to myself. And yes, I have worked with people who have been difficult and not really as welcoming for women, you know, especially sure. me who I didn't, I'm not from a wine growing family kind of an outsider. So finding mentors, finding people who can help you and kind of assist you moving in your career, that was really, really helpful. But as I've been in the industry, there's, there's definitely has been change. You know, starting out, I was always the only person at an event, even in college. I remember my weed science class, there was 50 of us and I was the only female in the week in the class. Right. The professor like looks around, he's like, Oh, this is welcome to weed management if you're not supposed to be here, leave now. And I was like, Oh no, I'm here. <laughs> I'm getting a. You're not getting uh, rid of me. <laughs> but um, yeah, the industry has definitely changed. I think there's more women in, in viticulture than there is in vineyard management. And I think that's, you know, cause it tends to have a little bit different of a background in starting. Um, and you know, you're, you're, yeah, once again, you're kind of by yourself, it's more technical and it's just kind of, 
it's easier, I think, to start there as a female than maybe running a crew. Right. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, there's that new um, group for women in the wine industry called Batonage that started a couple of years ago. Um, you know, there's a, a VIT women email group that's local where you can ask silly questions and not being right. made. Um, yeah, there's little like resources to help. So I think yeah. it's always scary when you start a career, especially if you're not from here, you have no idea. You don't know what, where to right. start. So it's always helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it sounds like you had a, a pretty good experience, you know, obviously some things changed and, but I know what you mean walking into an all male crew or, you know, when all the people around you are men and, you know, I, I've been around a long time. I've been in the industry 30 plus years and boy, it has changed. I was always the either the first woman doing something or the only woman doing something for many, many of the roles that, that I ha- held. And, you know, and, and, but like you, I mean, I didn't do that lean in thing either. I just was like, this is a job I want. It's a job I think I can be good at. I'm going to work hard and you're not going to be able to get rid of me because I'm going to be valuable. <laughs> and that exactly. was, you know, that was kind of my idea and, and it worked, it worked well. And I, and I think that that's good advice for women and, or for anybody really in general, just make yourself valuable. You don't have to become a man or, you know, like you say, lean in too much, just, you know, women don't have to be men. We just have to be good at our jobs. Right. And, and those people, people that don't want to work with you, like you don't need to be their best friend. You just need right. to work with them. And and it is funny, you think about viticulture, you know, think about, I think about the women I know, and between the men and the women that I know, so many more women garden than the men I know, although my husband does garden and I don't, but, but generally it's like, I, I know a lot of women who garden, I don't know that many men who do. So maybe it is kind of a natural thing uh, for women to desire to kind of be out in the vineyard, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> It's very focused work, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, that's just my my unscientific observation. (laughs) (laughs) So let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about, you know, we we know your job. We know how you got there. But talk about all you. I know you, you have several people under you with various roles. Can you talk about some of those roles and tell us, you know, what the requirements are are to be able to work in these positions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, under, so on my team, I have a viticulturist and you know, he has been working in the wine industry for several years as well. He has, he's from Argentina. So he has his agriculture engineering cert license or degree and for exactly what it is, how it translates. But yeah, so he's kind of just as science geeky as I am. Um, he's a little bit more of a gearhead, so that that balances me out because I don't care about tractors and he loves tractors. So it works. <laughs> We're a good team. And then uh, for our vineyard management, we actually don't have an internal vineyard management company, uh, our crew. So we, we have a third party company that does that. So we work with a local um, farm labor contractor um, who does our labor basically. And we've been working with the same vineyard supervisor, uh, Roberto, on our Spring Mountain property. I think he's been there for now for nine years. So the crew that we have, even though they're not technically Newton employees, you know, they're living, breathing Newton just as much as we are because their home, pro- you know, their vineyard work home, if you, however you want to call it, is Spring Mountain. And so they just are not on our payroll technically. Right. Um, that's pretty common for smaller properties um, is to have a third party contractor. And to get those kind of jobs, it, requirements are basically a desire to work hard and learn the craft because this is not, I wouldn't necessarily say we're talking about unskilled labor. I mean, maybe it starts no. off that way, but you know, these are people, at least from my experience and, you know, talking to other viticulturalists that, that they, you get kind of the same crew all the time, like whatever you mm-hmm. need, it's the same people coming back that have learned, you know, pruning a vine or harvesting grapes is not something that just anybody can do without, without a lot of training. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the, for us, the crew that we have they're they're on site all year. And it's the same crew all, you know, they live locally and that's important for us as well is that these people have a life and they have balance that's sustainable. Once again, sustainable right. to have a good workforce. And so these people, they know each block, they know that this one is a little less vigorous. So it's got a little bit less growth. So maybe we need to prune it 
a little bit different than the block that's basically a jungle. You know, they have all this knowledge. And yes, they don't have their master's degree or, you know, maybe they're bachelors or something, but, you know, it's definitely a skill to prune. Pruning is pretty hard. It looks easy, but to really make those judgment calls of, do I leave one bud or two buds or is this cane pruned? And, you know, do I, you know, how do I prune this or how do I leaf? Right. It's definitely a skill that you, you, anybody can really learn it essentially, but it's, it takes you a couple of years to really master that. And I think people undervalue the intelligence and ability that farmers have. Right. And just, it's not, yeah, it's the physical aspect of it too. Pruning all day, your hand gets that tired, your arm, it's repetitive work, you know? Right. It can be back, and when harvest especially can be backbreaking work too. Yeah. And we, uh, all of our, since we're on steep mountain, um, we can't machine harvest. So it's all hand harvesting at night um, because grapes are not like apples. You know, you, you don't buy a grape and put it on your counter and it continues to ripen. Right. As soon as you pick it, that is a snapshot in time. You need to get that grape cold to the winery so it doesn't start fermenting, you know, because not all fermentation is exactly what you want. It's not all good right. fermentation. So it's that snapshot in time. We park, we pick at night because the grapes are colder. It's easier for people. It's not as hot. Um, but at the same time, it's, it is kind of backbreaking work. You know, people, it's right. a lot of heavy lifting, uh, kind of running fast pace cardio. Um, yeah, yeah it's definitely bees, a challenge. Bees. They encounter a lot of bees in the vineyard. <laughs> you got yeah. sweet grapes, you're going to have bees. <laughs> Yeah, bees and wasps. We've all been stung at least once. <laughs> right, exactly. And, you know, you talk about pruning um, and training a vine. Uh, somebody, I was explaining this to a student, uh, you know, how you train a vine and you, you know, you can have head trained or cordon trained. And he looks at me, he goes, it sounds kind of like bonsai. And I mm-hmm. thought, you know, I had never thought of it that way, but it is a little bit like bonsai. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah or, or, or the way you trellis or prune your rose bushes. Rose bushes are very similar in some ways. So, yeah. if for for people who don't know exactly what we're talking about, it's kind of what what it is. <laughs> yeah, over time too, we have we have uh, one of the blocks that survived the fire. So we do have some some grapes that survived, um, a yeah. smaller portion, but we do. One of them, um, it's about they're about twenty years old. These vines now and. I like to say that the pruning and the training has been artistic. It's very almost Picasso style looking vines. You know, they're they're cane pruned, so they have a new shoot every year on the wire. Right. But over time, the the trunks are an S shape, where they're kind of you know. Right. I'm doing our motions, which of course you can't see on a podcast. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it looks like something you'd enjoy seeing at Halloween. but you know they're not the perfect kind of like tree trunk straight up and then perfect horizontal you know they've got a little bit of a wiggle to them um and that just you know it's like how would you look after 20 years you know right Uh, (laughs) especially nowadays we're all looking at our phone and we're all a little hunched (laughs) oh that's going to be a big problem for well it's going to keep chiropractors in business for a long time being hunched over our phones yeah Oh, gosh. So this is the part where I always ask my guests, can you give our audience, um, if, let's say someone's listening and they're thinking, you know, that sounds like something I'd be really interested in. How can they sort of, A, dip their toe in the water to see if it's something they like? And what other things could a person do that wants to pursue the, the viticultural path? You know, internships are a great way to start. It's really kind of throwing you into the woods a little bit, you know, sink or swim style. Um Oftentimes there's a lot, there's more internships for the seller than there are for the vineyard. The vineyards, um, typically you need less people. So there's just fewer jobs, but, um, you know, wine jobs is a great resource or even, um, UC Davis, they have Venn jobs and there's a lot of internship postings on there. You know, if you're not able to do that, you know, come to out to Napa, you know, there's, there grapes are grown in most of the 50 states. I think everywhere except for like Alaska. Um, and they make wine in Alaska, but I don't think they grow the grapes. Uh, okay. Right? The wine is made uh, everywhere. Yeah. So check out, reach out to your local growers and see if they need some help um, or go to wine shops. Just try to learn as much as you can. And then, yeah, I think education, knowledge is power. Yeah. But, you know, do an internship. Um, see if you really 
want to be by yourself all day walking vineyards. I mean, it's beautiful. Sometimes I have to remind myself to look up um, right. and actually enjoy where I am. But yeah, the first vineyard internship, usually you're counting clusters. So being able to count to 100 is important. <laughs> uh, you're sticky because you're collecting grapes uh, for sugar samplings. We need to know how much sugar is in the grapes, which will then be converted to alcohol. So it's a lot of walking, um, carrying bags of grape samples. You know, maybe you're starting to learn about what bugs are there, what are good and bad, what that red leaf means. You know, just be receptive be happy to learn. Good pair of hiking boots is a must. Yeah. For those of you, I, you know, I, everybody knows I'm a big fan of winejobs.com. And if you just type in the word under keywords intern, that's a good place to find internships. The one thing I always tell the audience is the gone are the day of, I get, and I get this question every single harvest. Hey, I'm coming out to Napa for a week. I'd like to maybe help with a harvest for a day or two. Those things don't happen no. anymore. They they might happen in other states, smaller states where there's you know not a lot of wineries, but here in California, the state no, that's long gone. There's too many OSHA requirements, and <laughs> and and you know by the, if you were here for a couple of days, by the time you knew what to do, you'd be leaving. So these are actually paid jobs that you have to commit to a certain time frame, you know, at least, I don't know, a couple of months, I'm guessing. Yeah, usually it's June through the end of harvest. So for us, since we're on the mountains and we're usually a bit cooler than the Valley Flores, um, you know, we've picked, our harvest has gone as long as November 10th months. Right, yeah. I get so, it done for Halloween, but yeah, so that sometimes it can be hard if you're in school um, and you have to go back in September. So for those people, I would suggest maybe check out a sparkling house. Um, yeah, they, 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 harvest earlier earlier. Than, you know, they, they harvest earlier. It's kind of more fast and furious as opposed to our extended harvest, but that would be yeah. a recommendation. Yeah. But just plan on spending a, a little bit of time. The idea of just coming for a couple of days is just doesn't really work for our industry anymore. It used to be kind of a thing you could do back in the day, but I mean, there are of course great stumps here, but that's all commercial. That's for the tourists. I mean, that's just a fun and it's fun to do. Um, yeah. But, you know, so plan plan to do that. And you can find those online, I'm sure, at Visit Napa Valley. But but actual working is not going to happen for a couple in a couple of days. But yeah, I mean, it's a small industry as well. So once you get your first internship, you know, reach out to other wineries, get to know people. Um, it's a small industry. So a lot of jobs are word of mouth and just knowing somebody. Um, so once you get your toe in, you're usually good to go. Right. And, and and internships often turn into either real jobs at the winery you're working, you're interning with, or like you say, with somebody else, you know, maybe a different winery. And I'm imagining interns kind of all seek each other out and hang out in their limited spare time, which I know they don't get a whole lot of. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's, a, it's an immersive experience. And I think that that I, I agree. And so from beyond internship, is there anything else someone could do? Are there uh, schools or courses that you would recommend to get started? Yeah, I know the Napa Valley has a lot of different courses, like the um, community colleges locally have courses that you can take a couple classes um, there's a lot of great in, resources. In viticulture? The yeah, college. in viticulture. Um, you know, there's a lot of great resources. You know, Marcus Keller uh, from Washington State, um, you know, he has a great uh, viticulture book. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of great resources out there for you to kind of start learning and self-educating. But at the same time, um, coming out, getting even chatting with hospitality people, to be able to taste in your room or a wealth of knowledge. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're here all year. They're happy to chat for the most part, you know, as long as it's not crazy busy, the weekends are usually uh, not the time that they want to be chatting. But if you come in on like a Wednesday, yeah. it's quiet, but yeah, just kind of asking people, asking questions, being kind of hungry in that way. Yeah. Everybody, you know, if you live and breathe in Napa Valley, you're going to pick up some information. Yeah. And you know, I, I, ha I have to say this and it, it, it's not really meant to be a shameless plug, but you know, if you're if you're thinking about wine and whether it's viticulture or anything else, you know, getting started on like your WSET certifications, take a level one if you're really a beginner. If you're not really a beginner, go to level two, um, and you you learn a fair amount about viticulture when you're taking WSET. It's not all about just grape varieties. It's about you know the the making of it. It's not 
extensive that way, but it, it at the longer you go into, the further you go into WSET, when you get to like level three, when you get to diploma, there's a whole unit about it. So, um, you know, that's another way of learning and it's not a, necessarily a required certification, but I would guess if you were interviewing somebody and they had their WSET level two or three or diploma, that might perk up your attention a bit. Um, yeah, I, it shows that they're passionate. Right. Yeah. Um, I You're always wondering. say for interns, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take somebody who's never seen a grape before. Um, as long as they're interested, your cover letter, when you're starting out in any job, tell me why you're interested in this. That's right. going to tell me that has more power to me than your resume does. A good cover letter right. when you're starting out, explain who you are, why I should pick you in a, in, you know, in an ocean of resumes cover letter is really what's important. That's a really, that's a really great point. Um, now, for the audience, the um, newtonvineyards.com, I'm going to put the, the link to Newton Vineyards and also to your career page um, in the links in the show notes. So for people who are interested in that, um, we'll be putting that there um, along with our just typical show notes that we have there. So, Laura, anything else you want the audience to know? Yeah, I mean, just come out, get to know the pro- the vineyards, and you know, we're always we're always here. Yeah, it's a great tasting experience, really, it really is. Um, and I want to thank you so much, Laura, for your time, for being you know being on the show and taking time. You know, these things don't. It's a nice forty five minute conversation, but there's more obviously that we and we know that to go into making a podcast. So all the time you've devoted to this beyond just the interview, I really appreciate. And I appreciate you sharing your expertise and your advice with our audience. I know they're uh, they're appreciative too. And thank you to our audience for being so loyal. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Well, have a great afternoon and uh, we'll catch the audience on the next show. Thanks to all of you for joining. And I hope today's show has inspired you to make a career out of your passion for wine. If you'd like to have a one-on-one career coaching session with me, just use the link in the show notes for more information or to schedule an appointment. This podcast is all about helping you follow your dreams. So feel free to send us your suggestions for guests or topics through our email link that's listed in the show notes. And it means an awful lot when you share us with friends or leave a review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. I hope you'll join us again for our next episode.